Good Shabbos, everyone. The story is told that several, several centuries ago, the Pope decreed that all the Jews had to convert or leave Italy. There was a huge outcry from the Jewish community, so the Pope offered a deal. He would have a religious debate with the leader of the Jewish community. If the Jews won, they could stay in Italy. If the Pope won, they would have to leave. The Jewish people met and picked an aged but wise rabbi, Moshe, to represent them in the debate. However, as Moshe spoke no Italian and the Pope spoke no Hebrew, they all agreed there would be a silent debate. On the chosen day, the Pope and Rabbi Moshe sat opposite each other for a full minute before the Pope raised his hand and showed three fingers. Rabbi Moshe looked back and raised one finger. Next, the Pope waved his finger around his head. Rabbi Moshe pointed to the ground where he sat. The Pope then brought out communion wafer and some wine. Rabbi Moshe pulled out an apple. With that, the Pope stood up and declared that he was beaten, that Rabbi Moshe was too clever and the Jews could stay. Later, the Cardinals met with the Pope asking what happened. The Pope said, first I held up three fingers to represent the Trinity. He responded by holding up one finger to remind me that there's still only one God common to both our beliefs. Then I waved my finger to show him that God was all around us. He responded by pointing to the ground to show that God was also right here with us. I put out the wine and wafer to show that God absolves us of all our sins. He pulled out an apple to remind me of the original sin. He had me beaten and I could not continue. Meanwhile, the Jewish community was gathered around Rabbi Moshe. They couldn't understand. Moshe, how'd you win the debate? I haven't a clue, said Moshe. First, he said to me that we had three days to get out of Italy. So I said to him, up, fill in the blank. Then he tells me that the whole country would be cleared of Jews, and I said to him, we're staying right here. <laughs> and then what, asked a woman. Who knows, said Moshe. He took out his lunch, so I took out mine. <laughs> Perhaps a true story at some point in the history of the Jewish people. Yes, this joke leads me to a great mystery of human history. And perhaps the greatest mystery ever, not just of our people, but really the greatest mystery in the history of the human race. How is it that we Jews are still here? We look at history, you know the holidays. We think about the tragedies that befallen our people, the pogroms and the expulsions, the massacres, and of course, the Holocaust. How is it that we Jews are still here? I asked my Seder participants that same very question just a few weeks ago at Passover, because it really doesn't make any sense. Large, powerful empires, the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, to the Germans of World War II, powerful empires, civilizations bent on our destruction, and yet they are no longer here, and we are. At my Seder table, I heard many answers. Perhaps, Brian, it's our willingness to fight on despite the odds, or maybe it's our faith in God, or perhaps it's our unique customs and traditions. And I agree with all those answers. But there's one answer I didn't hear, and one answer I'd like to share with you today, one answer that's found in our Torah portion. From the all-important verse that we read today, Bechai Bechem, and you shall live by them. If you've ever wondered how a religiously observant Jew could drive on Shabbat to the hospital, it comes from this verse. All the laws and customs of our tradition should never cause us to lose a life, but rather, you shall live by them. Except for the prohibitions against murder, incest, and idolatry, any commandment must be set aside for the concept derived from this verse, Bakuach Nefesh, our traditions mandate that life 
is paramount. Israel's armed forces rely on this principle to defend Israel from attack on Shabbat. And of course, one may violate Shabbat, violate Shabbat or a Jewish holiday to take someone to the hospital in an emergency. And doctors and nurses must not hesitate to violate the laws to save a life. Even on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. The great story is told of Rabbi Israel Salanter who confronted a raging cholera epidemic during the Day of Atonement centuries ago. The author of the book, Three Who Ate, describes how during this night of Kol Nidre centuries ago, the Gabbai first read the names of everyone, the thousands of people who had died during the course of that terrible summer in Europe. The next morning, after the reading of the Torah, the rabbi announced that everyone must make Kiddush, must eat and drink, lest their fast make them susceptible to the disease. A murmur swept through the congregation. They could not believe that their rabbi was telling them to eat on Yom Kippur. No one moved. Again, the rabbi commanded the worshipers to make Kiddush, to eat, to drink. There was still silence. And to the astonishment of the assembled, the rabbi asked for cake and wine. In the presence of the entire congregation, he made Kiddush, and he added the blessing who commanded us to live by them, my laws. He ate, and the congregation would finally eat. Even a fast on Yom Kippur can be broken if a life, one life, can be saved. Life is paramount. And our appreciation for life is found through our, throughout our tradition for life, Balaam Hazeh, for life in this world. Yes, we believe in the world to come. We believe in the afterlife. It's a fundamental part of our Jewish tradition, yet nowhere in the Torah will you find descriptions of heaven or hell, or even the emphasis of the importance of the world to come. How is that possible? Because the tradition is clear. God created our world and our tradition so that we as Jews make the focus of our lives this world and our way in this world. But Judaism has always been clear that religions that focus on the next world have a tendency to downplay this world. After all, if this world is only temporary, it's hardly worth the effort to right its injustices and alleviate its suffering. There's a reason that Jews have always been on the forefront of social action and community service. Because our task as Jews is to make the best of our lives in this world, while at the same time, our task is to make the world a better place for the betterment of everyone. Life, not death, is the central core and message of Judaism. Before we concern ourselves with paradise above, we have to create paradise below. The Chaim, to life, has always been the Jewish way. When we think about Judaism, in many ways, we often think about taking life to the fullest, about celebrating life. Despite the fact that our history has brought us again and again to the valley of the shadow of death, we constantly celebrate the beauty of this world. Think about these days right now. This past Thursday, we commemorated Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, done purposely a week before Yom HaTzma'ut, this upcoming week, Israel Independence Day. The message is again clear. Out of the ashes of the Holocaust arose the great symbol of Jewish life, Midinat Yisrael, the modern state of Israel. I'll never forget years ago at the bris of my oldest son, Joshua. And at the bris, we invited many of our childhood friends and their parents when the bris was conducted in Dallas. And I'll never forget a letter I received from the mother of one of my lifelong non-Jewish friends. She wrote me a letter saying, Brian, this is the first Jewish life cycle event I've ever attended. And now I get it. Now she said, Brian, I understand why the Jewish people are still here. Despite the tragedies of the past, I can see now, Brian, that the Jewish people make the best of life, that your life cycle events and your celebrations are so full of life. I now understand that despite the tragedies, why the Jewish people are still here. 
Yes, my friends, for the last several years, we've seen a lot of death, too much. A pandemic where hundreds of thousands of fellow Americans have lost their lives. People you and I know in our congregation, in our families. And now we see war and genocide in Ukraine, in Europe, in a place we never thought we would see it again. And it's easy to see life as expendable, of having little value. Despite the challenges that surround us, can we Jews still focus on sanctifying life, all life, to work harder to protect the lives of the innocent everywhere, and when we can, to celebrate and appreciate life to the fullest? Then we will continue to out-survive all of our enemies. A famous American general put it best, I'll never forget, days after 9-11 in the start of the war in Afghanistan. The following two quotes appeared side by side in newspapers across the country. One quote was from the Taliban Supreme Leader, Mullah Mohammad Omar, may his name be erased. And he said, the situation where we are now, there are two things, either death or victory. To those who are fighting and bombarding us, they should understand that the Afghan man is a fighter willing to die for jihad. Next to that quote was a quote from 1944 from General George S. Patton that said, if you want to remember, I want you to remember, speaking to his troops, I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. War, like our place in this world, it's not about dying for what we believe in. It's about living for what we believe in. That's the central core of the Jewish people. And if you've ever wanted to know what it means to be a Jew, remember, to live by the laws. Let me end with the following story. The story is told of a tradesman who drove into Vilna centuries ago with his wagon loaded with goods. It was a very late on a bitterly cold, snowy night. All was quiet and dark, but a single light burned in one of the homes. Freezing, the tradesman knocked on the door. The famous Gaona Vilna, the famous rabbi, was studying. He opened the door, and when he saw the poor state of the tradesman, the great rabbi ordered that the stove be stoked to warm him and that food and drink be prepared for him. And after he had eaten, the rabbi prepared a place for the man to sleep. Overcome with emotion, the man asked the rabbi, Rabbi, will I at least have a place in the world to come? The rabbi responded, What do you have in this world that you're so concerned about the next? What type of life do I have, asked the asked, answered the tradesman with a sigh. The whole week I'm on the move without a place to lay my head down. I don't have enough time to pray properly. I barely eke out enough to keep my family from starving. I rarely see my family. I have no time to enjoy myself. That's my life in this world. Think, said the rabbi. You have nothing in this world in spite of all of your hard work. What do you expect to have in the world to come for which you are not working at all? Shabbat Shalom, everyone.